All right, guys, I want to talk a little bit about forgetting. Uh, I want to talk about encoding failures, which is one of the ways that we forget, uh, probably the main way that we forget. And what you'll notice there is that it's not really forgetting, it's just that you never really put it into long-term memory. Problems with retrieval, which means the information is in your mind, but you can't get it out. And then we'll talk a little, a little bit about memory distortion, which is when you corrupt the memories that are actually already in your mind. But let's start out here with um, encoding failures. Okay. Now, when you have an encoding failure, the problem is that the information never made it into long-term memory. Sometimes it's just you never even got it into short-term memory. You might be uh, doing some work and it dawns on you that you need a calculator and you think, uh, I, there's a calculator in my bedroom, but you didn't focus on a calculator in my bedroom. What well, you just focused in my bedroom, right? That was the focus. And so you stand up, you go to your bedroom, and more than two seconds have passed. So by the time that you're in your bedroom, you think to yourself, why did I come in here for, right? Because the word calculator never made it past sensory memory. You just kind of set it to yourself in your mind, um, and it never made it into short-term memory. And so it didn't even give you 30 seconds. You only had two seconds of it in your mind. Um, now you walked into the right room because you focused on bedroom, but once you're there, you don't remember. Um, now, sometimes you do get things into short-term memory. Um, maybe you're doing some work in class. The teacher said an example. You got it into short-term memory. She told you to do an activity, and you did it real fast, and then you stopped thinking about it. And you just started talking to, with your friend about something else. And then you went home, and you think to yourself, geez, I know I did this in class, and I got it right. Because you got it into short-term memory, but then you never rehearsed it into long-term memory. And so even though you did it in class, you had it for those 30 seconds in class, once you stopped thinking about it, once you started chatting with a friend about something else, that memory just went away. And so you just don't have access to it. It's been more than 30 seconds by the time you get home. And so that memory just isn't in your mind anymore. And so these are what we call encoding failures. You never encoded that piece of information into long-term memory. And 90% of the things that you forgot, this is the problem. You never focused on it or you never rehearsed it. And that's why you don't remember it now. If I were to ask you which penny is the correct penny, there's a good chance that you don't remember. Um, you might remember some things about a penny, that it's a uh, copper color or that it's one cent. Maybe that Abraham Lincoln is on the penny. But most of us don't really focus or rehearse the minutia of the penny, all the extra little things on the penny. And so we might remember that it says one cent, but we forget that it says one cent on the back and not on the front. And maybe we forget, we know that Abraham Lincoln is on it, but we don't know which way he's facing. And so um, just in case you're interested in the actual answer, it is A. Um, uh, this is why sometimes somebody gives you a Canadian penny and you just move on. You don't even think about it because it, you are only looking for the size and color, and most of us are not really looking for anything else. The things that are encoded in our long-term memory is the size and the color, maybe the amount, the value, one cent, and all the other stuff. We might know one thing is there or the other, but most of that stuff we really have never focused on or we've never really rehearsed. Now, sometimes the problem isn't an encoding failure, it's retrieval. We 
we don't know how to pull it out of a long-term memory. The memory is there, but when we try to pull it out, something is blocking us. And I want to talk about a little bit more than a handful of the theories here. Now, one of these things is called a tip of the tongue phenomenon. And this is when you kind of remember that you know the answer, but you can't pull it out. And you might say, what is that girl's name? The girl who works in, uh, in, in my office. I know that I know her. I know that I know her name. Ah, oh, it's on the tip of my tongue, but I just can't pull it out. Now it could be that you're wrong and that you don't know her name, that that memory is, was never encoded in long-term memory. That is a possibility. But every once in a while, you're driving home and you go, Susan, that was her name. So it was definitely in there, but you couldn't pull it out at the right moment. So what's happening there? Well, let's say you know her name. And the way you learned her name was at one time that there was a, a party in the office and they had cake and you you know, the, it was in the lounge and it was Todd's birthday and somebody dropped some coffee and Mike made that one joke that you liked or didn't like. And um, you've made all of these connections. And in that party, you met Susan and she told you her name. If you could get to any of these memories, you would probably get to Susan. If you remembered Todd's birthday or the coffee falling or Mike's joke, any of those memories might get you to Susan's names because these are all in a network in your brain and getting to one will help you get to the other. But the problem is you don't really know Susan very well. And what you really remember about her is that she's kind of loud and she always wears those weird skirts and she works in HR and she is always angry about something and you always run away from her. And uh, again, uh, you never want to go to HR because she's like always there. And if you got stuck in this loop, in this network, well, this network is never going to get you to Susan because none of these ideas get you to the name Susan where you recorded it in your brain. And so you might go, oh, she's in HR. Oh my gosh, she's so loud. And I never always run away from her. And she's always wearing the skirt, right? And you kind of go over these memories over and over and over. And they, none of them ever get you to Susan. On the way home, for whatever reason, you triggered the right memory. And now, oh, Susan, that was her name, Susan. So now, the better you know Susan, the more you're likely to connect these two networks. Um, and so any one of them will get you to Susan. But uh, right now, because you don't know her very well, you have two separate networks in your brain. And so one of them gets you to her name and the other one does not. Okay. Now I want to talk a little bit about uh, the primacy effect and the recency effect. Um, again, these are these both create problems in retrieval. The primacy effect suggests that anything that you learn at the beginning of an event, you tend to remember that well. Why? Because you have time to rehearse it. You have time to think about it and get it inside your long-term memory. And so things that you learned first tend to be things that you remember later. And the recency effect also means that uh, the things that you remembered or that you went over most recently, those things you're likely to remember. Why? Because you just learned them and they're just in your short-term memory or you just got them into long-term memory. And so they're easier to remember. What these two, when you put them together, these two theories, what they suggest is that the stuff in the middle those things are hard to remember. So if you have a long class that um, you, you go to a class that lasts uh, two hours or three hours, 
the stuff that you learn in the middle, that stuff tends to be hard to remember. And so you should probably take time to study that a lot more when you get home, because those are going to be the things that you're going to forget right away. Whereas the things in the beginning and the things towards the end, they stay a little bit more fresh in your mind. Another issue with retrieval is how we pull it out of long-term memory. So some things uh, you can retrieve very easily uh, or uh, depending on how they are retrieved. And some things are very hard to retrieve. If I ask you to remember the things I'm teaching you in class um, through what we call free recall, you're probably going to have a hard time. Why? Because I'm going over just lots of information, uh, just almost nonstop. I go over, you know, 10 minutes on this and then 10 minutes on that and 10 minutes on this other topic. And I go through oh, a lot of different topics. And for free recall, you really have to have some kind of mastery over the topic. Free recall is like when I ask you to write an essay, or if I ask you to uh, describe somebody to a sketch artist, you have to have a pretty decent sense of what that person looks like to just recall it uh, without any help. Most of us hate free recall tasks, especially if it's a class that we're not good at. Most of us prefer recognition tests, like multiple choice questions or a lineup of suspects, because if the information is inside our brain, we will recognize the right answer. But sometimes, even if it's in there, it's hard to just do a free recall. Now, if the information is not in your brain, oops, sorry, this you're not. It doesn't matter how much uh, multiple choice I give you, you're not going to recognize it because it's not in your brain. But if it's in there, it's so much easier to recognize the right answer. So let me give you an example. I might tell you, what were the economic factors that led to the Civil War? Write an essay. Ugh, there's a good chance that unless you just went over this or you are pretty good at uh, history or social studies, maybe you just don't know how to answer that question, even though you might know the answer. But if I give you a multiple choice test, and I say, what were the economic factors that led to the Civil War? Was it A, the mass production of cars, B, the North American Free Trade Agreement or NAFTA, C, cotton production in the South, or D, the T tax of 1773? Well, if you know the answer, you might be able to recognize it quickly. If you don't know the answer, well, then you just don't know the answer. It does, I could put 20. Uh, multiple choice uh, choices up there, you're never going to get it because it's not in your brain. But if it is, it's easier to recognize it than it is to um, than it is to just free recall it in an essay. Now, the last one you see there is queued recall, and the way that you probably do queued recall most easily or most commonly is songs. If you hear the first couple of notes to a song, there's a good chance that it triggers a song to turn on, kind of like priming. Um, if I say a line, a lyric uh, or uh, from a song, sometimes that'll just trigger a memory. Sometimes you're trying to think of the name to a song, but you can't remember it. And so you kind of hum a few bars or you go through the lyrics real fast and that will trigger the name of the song. Why? Because you always learn those things together. You always learn the melody with the lyrics. You always remember the beat with the melody, or the chorus almost always has a part of the, uh, of the title in it. And so because you always uh, remember those things together, or you always learn them together, if you want to think about one, you can often think about the other and it'll trigger the memory. In psychology, a lot of times we do word associations. I'll give you a bunch of words and some of the words are blue and some of them are green and maybe some of them are red. 
And if I ask you, what was the third, the fifth, and the sixth question, word, you might say, I don't know. But if I ask you, what were the blue words? That might be easier for you to remember because every time you were the word, it was blue. And so sometimes thinking about the blue word will trigger the right memories. Mnemonic devices work like this, right? Um, if I tell you what is the order of operations, you might go, ugh. But if I uh, tell you what is PEMDIS, or if you use PEMDIS, you might go, oh, PEMDIS, I, I know that P is for parentheses and E is for exponents. Or please excuse my dear Sally, please is parentheses, excuse is um, exponents. I still use PEMDIS to remember the order of operations, whatever, 38 years later. Um, it's still the one way I remember the order. Now, another issue with uh, memory and uh, how clear a memory is, uh, we call encoding specificity. And one of the things about encoding specificity is that when you're young or when you're doing something for the first time, you tend to encode more specifics. If I were to ask you about your summers when you were in middle school, there's a good chance you have incredible memories about that. You remember who you hung out with and the things you did and how much time you spend in the woods and with the time you got in trouble. And they're very specific memories. But by the time that you were a senior or a junior, there's a good chance that your memories stop being so specific, unless they were really cool and you did something very different. Um, uh, I remember one memory or one summer when I was in college where we kind of stayed, you know, it was the first time we stayed out all summer uh, out by the beach. And that memory is still very clear. But most of my other summer memories in college, they're just not that clear. We drank a lot and, you know, hung out with a lot of different friends, went to a lot of, a lot of different parties. Um, they're just kind of bunched up. And I just kind of remember chunks of things. Like we went to parties. Yeah. And I remember a little bit of this party and a little bit of that party. And if you ask me, did this happen in this party or did it happen in that other party? I'm like, I don't, I don't remember. It was a bunch of different parties. Um, because as you get older, you stop trying to remember everything by uh, every, you know, you stop trying to encode memories chunk by chunk or piece by piece, and you just kind of start to encode just general things, parties that I went to, or, you know, vacations that I went to. Um, and so they stop being so specific. And the older you get, the less specific your memories tend to be. Again, unless it's something that's very different. Now, memories that are very different, sometimes we store as flashbulb memories. And these are memories that are incredibly specific. Even though you're older, they're incredibly specific. And they tend to be about um, important times or very traumatic times in your life. And so you're gonna remember weddings, important birthdays, um, things like that, funerals, especially if it's the first funeral you went to or the funeral of someone you loved a great deal. Um, those memories tend to be flashbulb memories and they are very crisp and clean. And even years later, you might say things like, I remember that like if it was yesterday. But here's the problem with flashbulb memories. They're really no more accurate than any other memory. Even though they feel more clearly, they aren't necessarily more clear or more accurate, I should say. Um, when, we, when we study flashbulb memories, um, we find that people just really don't remember what they think they remember. Um, the Challenger disaster, if you don't know, is when uh, the Challenger uh, rockets uh, shuttle went up and the Challenger 
uh, shuttle had a lot of civilians, teachers and other people. And uh, it blew up. And so because they had a teacher, everybody in uh, the United States, especially all little kids, were watching it. Um, everybody put it on, all the schools put it on. And years later, when you ask people about the disaster, they they tell you they remember it like if it was yesterday. And they'll tell you, I was at this school or I was working in this place and I heard it here or the blah, blah, blah. And when you can verify the information, right? They said, I was in this school and you can verify, were they at that school? Because obviously you could just check paperwork. What we find is about 25% um, uh, of people, not of people, but of the memories presented contradictory information. Um, that is, they said they were at that school, but really they weren't at that school. They said they worked at such and such place, but really they didn't. And so, um, you know, the memories that are messed up in your mind are going to be different than the ones that are messed up in my mind. But what we tend to find is that about 25% of those memories are inaccurate in a minor or a major way. Um, traumatic events, especially, can be corrupted by the anxiety that you feel. And so if I'm very anxious, I can hear somebody else say something and I can encode it as if though it were a real memory in my mind. And in one of the videos uh, you watched uh, from YouTube, you'll see that one of the boys um, who is in the classroom where the purse was snatched says that he remembers the, um, the purse snatcher had a messed up nose. And that memory wasn't a memory that he saw. It never came from his sensory memory, at least not his visual memory. Um, it came because he heard the professor say it, and he encoded it as if though it was his memory and not just something he heard somebody else say. Now, here's just a couple of um, other uh, things here. Uh, decay just occurs after you stop rehearsing memories for a while and the memory stops being as sharp or you stop having access to it quite as much. So you haven't thought of your best friend from kindergarten in 15 years. And when you meet him, you can't really remember his name anymore. Um, that is decay. If I give you enough time or if I give you the right trigger, I might be able to get the, mem the name out because it's technically still in there, but it's hard for you to pull it out because of decay. Now, proactive and retroactive interference has to do with, with old and new memories. So in proactive um, interference, older memories inhibit new memories. And so if um, I ask you what your new friend's name is uh, or what her, um, what her married name is, um, you might be able to remember her maiden name, but not her her uh, married name and um, because the, the older one is the one that you remember. Sometimes this happens when you have a, a new boyfriend or girlfriend, right? You're used to your old boyfriend or girlfriend's name and you used to say, you know, Charlie, where are my keys? And Charlie, I'm hungry. And Charlie, let's go to the movies. Or Charlie, I can't find my purse. But now you're not dating Charlie anymore. You're dating Max. And, you know, most of the time you remember Max, but all of a sudden you can't find your keys and you're likely to go, Charlie, where are my keys? Because that memory uh, in this memory or in this scenario, Charlie, the old memory, is blocking the new memory of your new boyfriend's name. So you should call him Charlie uh, instead of Max. Whereas in retroactive, the opposite is happening. The newer memory is inhibiting the old memory. And so you can't recall your old phone number, but you can remember your new phone number. Now, sometimes you might think, I, 
Maybe I just don't even remember my old phone number. Maybe it's not even there anymore, but that's likely not the case because at one point you knew your old phone number. Uh, you knew it by heart. So therefore it has to be in your brain. It's just, you can't pull it out because now whenever you think a phone number, you pull out your new phone number. And so that new one is consistently interfering with pulling out the old one. Um, we talked about uh, cue dependent forgetting. Uh, here, uh, your memories are not necessarily retrieved easily. If the cues don't match, um, you run into a classmate at the grocery store. You know his name in classroom, but at the grocery store, you can't remember his name because something about the um, classroom primes you to the name in the grocery store, there's nothing to prime you to the name. I'll be honest with you, when I'm learning my students' names, I often remember it by where they're sitting in the classroom. And so if they're sitting in the correct seat, I tend to remember their name. But if they stand up after class, I often have to look at where they're sitting and then I can remember their name. Uh, but if I don't, if I don't look or if I can't remember where they're sitting, then I forget their name entirely because the memory is cue dependent. Now, repression and motivated forgetting are very similar, but they're just slightly different. In both of these, the memory exists in your mind, but you don't have access to it anymore. Now, in repression, the reason you don't have access to it anymore is because the rest of your brain said, nope, you can't have access to this memory anymore. Your brain decided without you that you don't have access to this memory. Usually this memory has, is traumatic. Maybe you saw someone get shot and now you've repressed the memory. And in some cases, you might not even remember seeing someone get shot if the repression is very deep. Um, but maybe you do remember that this person was shot. You just can't really remember how it happened, right? That is repression. Now, repression can be um, uh, quite extensive where you don't remember any part of the memory. Sometimes people get molested or abused in childhood. And as adult, they don't remember that at all. Um, they might still react as if though they remember. Maybe you grab their arm and they get very angry with you. Don't touch me, they might say. And if you ask them, why did you react like that? They'll say, I just don't like it when people touch me like that. Um, but they don't remember the actual memory. Now in motivated forgetting, basically you just stop rehearsing a memory on purpose. So maybe you, uh, you fell when you were in high school and that was really embarrassing. And every time you think about it, you're pretty embarrassed about it. So you try to not think about it. And after a while, you stop thinking about it. And if someone uh, reminds you, it might take you a minute. Oh, oh, did that have, oh yeah, I do remember that. Maybe if I tell you the right, the right trigger word, it'll, the memory will come back. If I show you a photo, the memory might come back. Sometimes you're scrolling through your Instagram, some old photos. And you go, oh, I completely forgot that that happened. But the memory triggers uh, the memory to come back, or the picture triggers the memory. But otherwise, you completely forgot. That would be motivated forgetting. In repression, if I tell you this thing happened to you, you're probably going to say, no, it didn't. And you might even get angry with me. You might say, you might yell at me, no, that did not happen. I've never gone through something like that because it's your brain that's trying to protect you from the memory. So when I remind you of it, your brain might push you to continue to not rehearse the memory. And you might actually get angry with me uh, just so that you don't have to relive that memory again. Okay. Now let me talk very quickly about memory distortions. Sometimes um, you remember something, but you remember it incorrectly. People sometimes think that their memory is like a digital camera, but it's not. If you take out your phone 
and you record an event, when you press play, that video is going to play exactly the way it played the first time it happened. Memory isn't like that. Remember, remember that memory um, uh, is going to include only the things that you focused on. And so anything that you didn't focus on just isn't inside your memory. And also, what you rehearse is what you remember. And so if you don't rehearse certain things, even though you remembered it the first time or you focused on it the first time, if you don't rehearse it uh, correctly when you are doing that maintenance rehearsal, sometimes then uh, it gets stored incorrectly. Or if you rehearse it and I include something extra, I tell you something um, and you rehearse it as if though it's part of your memory, later on you might remember it with this extra piece of information that didn't exist the first time around. Okay, Memory can be distorted by a lot of different things, including just how you rehearse it. Um, and if I give you misleading information or I add certain things, uh, that will distort your memory. Again, hopefully you already watched the video of the purse snatcher. Um, and one of the things that you'll notice is that uh, they asked the students, what did the purse snatcher look like? And they go, he was five foot six. And then the other person says, he was six foot two. What? That's crazy. How is it possible that this, these two people have such different memories of the purse snatcher's height? Well, the truth is that sometimes they just didn't focus on the purse snatcher's height. But when I ask them, what did he look like? They go, well, I probably remember that. And they, they'll pull some other memory out of just the millions of folders that they have in their memory, in their long-term memory. They pull something at random, and if they rehearse it, the guy was five foot six, then now that's the way their memory looks, even though in the beginning that wasn't in their memory. One of the things you'll notice was that they said, um, the guy had a ski jacket it was white or it was yellow. I don't, you know. Um, again, the ski jacket wasn't white or yellow. The guy didn't have a plaid shirt on. Um, he had a jean shirt on and his uh, ski jacket was like a blue color. Um, so why did these people make that up? Well, they didn't. What happened was that they saw the ski jacket, they uh, rehearsed ski jacket, but they never rehearsed the color scheme. That, either they didn't focus on it or they just didn't rehearse it. For whatever reason, it's not in long-term memory. But for most people, if you ask them, well, I remember that I had a ski jacket. What color was it? Most of us go, gee, I have to remember the color because I remember seeing the ski jacket. And so what they do they open some random folder in their brain. And maybe that folder is just a ski jacket they saw, you know, on vacation or in a catalog when they were little. And they go, yeah, white ski jacket, because that's the one I'm seeing in my mind. They're not lying, right? They think they're telling you what the ski jacket looked like because that's what they're seeing in their mind right this second. I would like to point out that oftentimes um, racism, prejudices have this mechanism, right? People don't focus on the right things. And then later when I ask them, what did the guy look like who robbed the store? They open up a random folder. And unfortunately, that random folder has some racist aspect to it. Not, it's not your fault. That was stuffed in your brain when you were watching a show when you were a little kid or you heard somebody say something random. And now, because you don't remember what the guy actually looked like, you open up this folder and you go, it was a black guy with a hoodie on. 
And I promise you, you can ask any cop and they're going to tell you, yeah, everybody says a black guy with a hoodie because people's biases get involved when they don't actually focus on the right things. Um, in the video, you might have heard, sir, heard the researcher say, one of the problems with memory is that people don't know what they do wrong. And so they never learn how to do it right. Most of us, when someone has a gun in your face, don't think to ourselves, let me look at this guy's face and clothes so that I can remember it later. Most of us are only looking at that gun. Most of us are only looking at the purse he grabbed. And so later, when they ask you what did he look like, you go, well, I must remember because I totally was there and I saw him. But unfortunately, you never focused, you never rehearsed it. And so now what you're pulling out of your mind is a random memory from who knows when. You think you're telling the truth, but in reality, you're just sort of uh, falling victim to some random bias that was put into your mind without your permission. It was just put in there without you. Um, and yet it's still something that happens to everyone. Um, uh, we're all uh, capable of these biases because we all have the same problems with our memories. Um, again, when we talk about eyewitness testimony, this is one of the biggest problems. Psychologists hate the fact that the uh, legal system depends so heavily on eyewitness testimonies because eyewitnesses consistently make um, mistakes that are uh, almost predictable. Uh, but because our legal system depends on eyewitness testimony, it often makes really crazy mistakes where, again, you ask someone, who was the person that raped you? And that person says it was such and such person or they looked such and such way. And then when we go to a DNA analysis, we figured out that that person was wrong, not lying. This person in their mind, this victim, uh, was telling you the truth the best as, uh, as best they knew it. But consistently, this is a problem that we have with eyewitness testimony. Um, the Loftus experiment um, is another way that we test uh, how memory is uh, messed up, is damaged. And so we'll, sometimes we'll do this on video, someone will watch a video, or sometimes it'll be in person, literally they'll be in a parking lot. Um, but in either case, video or in person, what they see is a car um, speeding. It crashes into another car, usually a parked car. It pulls back and then it uh, drives away. And then someone comes over and says, ask the, the witness, what did you see? You know, what did the car look like? Things like that. And then they'll say, how fast was the car going when it hit the other car? And depending on how I ask that question, people will give different answers. So if I say, how fast was this car going when it smashed into the other car? People tend to say a higher miles per hour. But if I say, how fast was the car going when it made contact with the other car? People are likelier to give a lower miles per hour. No one does this on purpose. No one says, if the cop says smashed, I'll say 41. If the cop says made contact, I'll say 32. But the word that the cop uses to ask this question will prime your memory. And sometimes it'll prime it to go faster or to go slower. And now you rehearse the memory in this specific way and you have completely altered your memory. Um, uh, from the first time that you actually saw the events. This is Elizabeth Loftus, and it's important to point out that um, some people to this day send death threats to Elizabeth Loftus. Unfortunately, when she first started um, studying false memories, she started studying uh, with a specific group, and specifically the group was people who had recovered memories of child abuse. 
And people do have recovered memories, right? Sometimes you're looking through photos and you remember something that you hadn't remembered in a long time. Oh, I remember this photo. Wow, I completely forgot about it. So uh, recovered memories are real. And obviously, you can recover memories of abuse if you have repressed it at some point. But what Elizabeth Loftus points out is that there is no way to determine the difference between a false memory implanted in a person and a real memory that is recovered. How does she do this? Well, there's a lot of different studies, but this is one of them. Uh, she'll have people come in and usually they'll come in with like, I don't know, a couple of um, family members and each family member is asked to write a memory that they have about you. And then they'll give you all the memories and they'll have you read the memories and they'll ask you whether or not you remember or not. One of the memories they give you, however, is completely made up. It's usually about being lost in a uh, mall and you know who you saw there or didn't see there, et cetera. And most people will remember that memory, even though it can't possibly be real because it never happened. It's completely made up. What's probably happening is that, again, you have half a memory over here and a chunk of a memory over there. And so you just kind of put them together with the narrative that you're reading and you just make up a brand new memory that didn't exist 10 seconds ago. Um, and again, people can't tell the difference between those memories and memories that um, are actually recovered. Eventually, Elizabeth Loftus, uh, you know, she got some papers pulled. She there was she had you know very rough couple of years while this was happening, and so she changed her group. So instead of studying people who had recovered memories of child abuse, she started to um, study people who had recovered memories of alien abductions. And what did she find? The exact same things. Um, and so. Uh, unfortunately, you know, people thought that she was saying that everyone who had recovered memories of child abuse was lying. That's not what she was saying. The point that she's making is that there's no way to determine the difference between a false memory and a real memory that was recovered. And unless you have other evidence to back up what um, what the person is remembering, it, you know. It really uh, isn't enough to, let's say, convict somebody on that because there is no way to tell the difference. Um, I'm going to let you read about that. Okay. Uh, guys, that is the end of Chapter 7. Um, and if you have any questions, please let me know. Send me an email, um, and I will do my best to answer those questions, whether it's a study packet or the mind taps um, or anything like that. Uh, just send me a quick email. Again, I can't wait to hear from you and uh, have a good one.